I'm super excited to share this interview with you. You often hear the advice, diversify your income when you're gonna be a self-employed artist. But today I'm talking to Nicole Tamron. Nicole has been doing art licensing for about 10 years and art licensing is her only source of income. And as you'll hear, she does a ton of artwork. She's super, super talented. And I'm so excited to share all her wisdom with you guys today. I am so excited to be joined today by Nicole Tamron. Nicole is a watercolor artist who does work for art licensing and she is such a talented artist and I'm so excited to have her here today to talk about how she got started and what she has been working on. She got her start about 10 years ago at Surtex, which if you haven't heard, it's it's like the major service pattern design trade shows for art licensing and for purchasing outright. So I'm really excited to pick her brain today. Hi, Nicole. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining me. Can you give me a quick summary of how you got started in this business? Yeah, sure. So the um, kind of short cliff notes version is I did go to school for illustration. Um, but I didn't get into that right away. I was actually a really young mom and I kind of did all the things that were not art just to sort of get by and do that. But I actually got into, I guess, uh, licensing because I lost a illustration job that was a freelance job. And I just happened to ask the right question of the right person. And they directed me towards this thing called licensing. And I think when I saw that, I just had this kind of familiar. I just, it felt so me, I guess is all I could say about that. So as I was going through and researching, I would just see more and more things that just felt like such a fit. So I basically just dove headlong into researching that um, and also kind of retraining my brain. It had been quite some time since I had been out of school. So I had to, anything I could kind of get my hands on, whether it was entrepreneurship or just running a business, or of course, anything with art licensing attached to it, I was reading and kind of absorbing um Tara Reed used to do these ask calls yeah she <laughs> was a big Love back then yeah. yeah so I would just kind of just listen my way and, and feel my way around and then I I did I just jumped in both feet first I didn't really know anything about it and I just was hanging up burnt banners at Surtex before I had ever shown my art to anyone in the industry but that's how I started so again non-art job and then just kind of Jumped right in. Real moment, yeah, and then just jumping right in. I, I love that. What? So was that around like 2010? What surtex was yeah, that? Yeah, um, so I found out about the show in September of 2010, and um, I walked the show in 2011, and then I exhibited in 2012. So it was okay. basically a year and a few months process between never hearing the word before at all and having zero portfolio to actually exhibiting so it was wow it sounds like a long time but it's kind of not if you don't know anything like I did not know how to make a pattern I didn't know yeah what art I just I just saw the way art was used through this this woman's portfolio and I I just knew it was a fit and so I think it was more you know it was a year and a half of just learning something that just felt like it would be the thing so that I don't know that that's amazing. like what I would recommend now, of course, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> we are living in the age of no trade shows. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's what I was going to say, like you just dove right in, but what would you, what do you think, you, how would you advise someone who was getting started now, especially considering Surtex is currently hasn't, know. <laughs> you know, we don't know if it's going to come back or not actually. I know. And it was honestly, I, I it kind of was on its last leg to begin with, which hurts my heart a bit just because yeah, I I same. really do that is how I changed my career I mean it was life-changing for me to do that show but here's the thing I actually think that there were some things I learned by doing that show that I learned by doing but I think the principles still exist and you do not need a trade show to do it and so for me I didn't know anybody in the industry I didn't know anything about it so it was a default by going there and having companies be attracted to my work so a certain set of companies were obviously attracted to the type of art I did. And for me, that was the stationary and greeting card market. And you kind of got that like overwhelming sense that that's, if I looked at all of the different industries that I spoke to that first year, the bulk of them were in that, that sort of target market. Mm. So I would suggest the same thing. I learned it by the practical doing of it, but I can, I've been there and I've done it. And I would suggest the same thing to a new artist is to pick a specific industry that you really focus on and start creating a portfolio for that. And you might say, well, you know, you got to sit there and 
how companies come up to you. Well, there's amazing information now. Like you have phenomenal classes. There's great things on Skillshare. There's so much sharing going on in the industry. When I was starting, there was only like a couple people. Like Tara, I give her so much credit for really, you know, spearheading that. That was something that she really brought and was sharing. And she got a lot of pushback, honestly, from other artists oh, for really? doing it. And, you know, but now I don't think that's really the case. I think it's really a sharing community. So there's so much you can learn that way. And if you think, well, how do I know what industry my work would be good for? I think there's there's so many people you can get to review a portfolio. A lot of agents can do that. And there are people very, very knowledgeable about the market that could help you pick that direction. So I still think that's what, the, again, mine happened by default. I spent a lot of money on a show that helped me come up with that solution. But it's still a solution that would work today is to pick an industry, create work for that market. And then it doesn't mean that market will not will be all you'll do it's just that the art created for it will find other places but it's the direction I think that's really important to do in the beginning yeah definitely I mean I didn't I didn't start with one like product category either because when I jumped um from working in-house I I had done home textiles and then my last job was apparel and so but my interest really was stationary and cards. And like in my spare time, I was working on like greeting card designs and stuff like that when I was working in-house. So then when I jumped out, you know, I wanted to do this type of stuff that was on paper and greeting cards, yeah. but I had like the resume for doing the other stuff. So that is where like, I was kind of doing, you know, kind of pitching to everyone. And that's definitely, you know, I think what took part of the reason that you know it took me a while to get some traction in in freelancing um it is is because I was kind of like scattershot and so I definitely recommend that too in my in my class of like that's like the first thing is like you know yeah. let's pick something and no one wants to pick something and I understand because look I didn't you know like I I get it but it's like just start even if it's like you know six months a year like then you can expand but like you have to start somewhere right so this is a question that I get all the time and you are the person to put it to bed like you can tell people that this is not true <laughs> Because you do such beautiful, traditionally hand-painted work. Um, it's so gorgeous. And I'm sure, you know, obviously with that hand-painted work involves a lot of Photoshop work afterwards mm -hmm. to scan it, get it into the right positions and, you know, make full repeats and stuff. Because I've definitely seen on your Instagram that you paint, you know, yeah. individual pieces and then put it kind of together. So do you need to use Adobe Illustrator to be a surface pattern designer? You do not. Okay. <laughs> people are, people are sighing relief because I mean, I love Illustrator, so, you know, I'm happy know. to, but you absolutely do not. No, right? you don't. But I also, I do understand where it comes from. And I will tell you, it's when I was first looking into it, I don't know if it was just a combination of the people who do share online and what they use. But I also thought that too, because all I was looking at is that, oh my gosh, all these people that do licensing, nobody's art looks like mine. And I really, that was my impression before I was actually walking Surtex. I did not think there were people that did traditional art. Like that's, and so it's just a very skewed belief, but it was, yeah, you do not need to illustrate. In 10 years, I've never been asked to use Illustrator. Now, do I think you should be able to open the program and lay out a template and do all that? I, I do. I think it's a worthwhile time to like feel your way around. But in saying that, I don't tend to do that until I need to. So <laughs> until yeah. I actually have a client saying, we need this, like the deal is I'll figure it out enough that I need to for that, that one thing. But yeah, you don't need it. I mean, again, I think traditionally absolutely right there's no reason that i would give them an illustrator file so yeah if you're a traditional painter you know learn photoshop it is your friend i think that that is extremely important since nothing ever gets delivered traditionally at this point right so it's all going to be digital but yeah you don't need illustrator so we can put it to bed but yeah i love yes. the question and i had it too so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so sort of a follow-up to that is that, you know, client, you just said that no one has even asked you, which of course they wouldn't because of the type of artwork work yeah. you do, but you never know. Um, but do clients, do you have like a particular method of setting up your files that makes it easier for companies? Or is there anything, you know, that you've, anything that you've learned in being a Photoshop artist 
that you know really translates for art licensing i think so this is the other thing i think we especially when i was getting in you always worry like is there a right or wrong way to do something yes well that's the thing exactly especially like i was self-taught in this area like completely from like little random scraps of information right so you don't really know (laughs) what you're doing is what they want you always want to be professional and all those things so i definitely i mean i have my own methods but i'm also a pretty structured organized person so like I'm a Virgo, which basically means I have a method for everything. Doesn't mean it's like the right one, but it's my one. And I definitely am very organized with my files, not while I'm working on them, but if I'm going to deliver them to a company or now with my agents, I, I, I really, I have a whole section of time. I call it file packaging and prep, which is where I put everything into folders. And I am like folders, upon folders, upon folders, everything's labeled. But really what it is, is so that either me working down the road, it's easier for me to make adjustments or the companies are able to make adjustments. And I have to say, if I was delivering to a client that I knew was making a certain product, I would probably be sort of minimizing the amount of folders I'm giving them. But because my art sort of gets sent on without that kind of pre-knowledge, unless I'm putting something in a template, I do keep it super, super flexible. So essentially they can pull any single icon out of a piece of mine to use on on alternate projects. So I think for me, that's really important. Plus I think, I don't know why, but there's like that horror stories you hear from in-house designers and they'll be like, oh my gosh, this artist's files are so messy and we always have to clean it up. And I always think, oh my gosh, I don't want that to be- Don't let it be me, yeah. (laughs) But I think there's also the idea that you want to make it easy for people to work with them. And so just in the way that it's, and I will tell you one thing I'm horrible at and I need to get better. I don't use a lot of fonts just because I do so much hand lettering, but I always forget to leave a layer that's the font as the font that's like live text. Yeah, like, yeah. oh my gosh, the number of hours I have spent looking for the font I use, like, and that's on me completely, but I just like, I wish I was better in that one regard, but I think it's because I don't have a design background. I'm not used to using fonts in, in many ways. So I think that's just something I'm still trying to like wire my brain. So just keep the layer, keep the layers. So you don't yeah, you can do, it. yeah, you can have like a live text layer and yes. then make it and then expand it. Yeah. <laughs> like, Hide the live text. Yeah. That's, um, Good, good information. Like yeah. Again, same again, and, right? Like the companies have never come back and said, oh, your files are bad. Like, right. You never get that feedback from people. So I always think like, I get, you start where you are. Generally companies have such sophisticated, I mean, they, the people have amazing departments, so they can really work with a lot of what we give them as artists. So I feel like it's not something that should hold you back from, from submitting yeah. or being worried about it. Just ask questions if you have any kind of like concerns about it, but yeah, I'm exactly. pretty, pretty organized. Just, labeled file folders just trying to make it as easy as I can and as flexible as I can yeah totally and layers I'm sure and everything of course (laughs) yeah so that's yeah that's great advice I appreciate that and I think people you know that's people are worried about not being you know I feel like having those first few client interactions is a big uh thing that makes people nervous and it's because they don't know if they're doing it right especially if you're self-taught but oh, honestly, yeah. even if you were taught in, in school, you know, every company has different needs and every artist and school does things different. Like there's yeah. no, unfortunately, there's no like full universal, you know, you must do it this way, um, which is great for creativity, but it does, it, I think, uh, create a lot of anxiety because people are like, oh no, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? And and there you isn't know, a right when, way. When you work with a client over time, like I have certain clients I've worked with forever and I know how they like their style set up now right so there's also that idea that every time we work with someone new we're all just the first time that is what I say too you know that's one of those things like even though we think we're new you're really not we're all new so it's just like as you give up that comfort yes it translates client to client but also like as you work with a single client they're going to know exactly what they need what they need to see from you and you know, that process will get easier and easier as you go. Yeah, exactly. It's like I, whenever I have a new client, I'm, a, I'm like an amateur all over again, right? That's, that's totally it. You're right. And that's how, I mean, I, I agree. I say that all the time too. Um, so what are a couple things that you think surface designers in this business should know besides how to create art? Mm, yeah, it's funny. I almost feel like 
the creation of art is so oh secondary <laughs> so secondary i mean it's like the absolute first and then it's like the it's like, like not, afterthought forever yeah. yeah i think um if i had to boil it down if there's a couple ones um i think that communication is the biggest thing and i don't know if this is because my previous jobs always required great communication but i was a little bit surprised how poor communication can be in this industry when you're sort of like trying to fill needs for people. So I think that what I realized, and one thing I'm actually, I'm really good at, and it's, I didn't know it was a skill at the time, is I've learned to ask really good questions to have, um, I guess, things answered that the person doesn't even realize they should communicate. Yes, yes, that's, that's a great. Really, really big one. And I think, um, again, it's not that you, it's on the table initially. It's just that the more projects you do, you realize it saves you time and them time. But it's not just time. It's like the ability to have your art picked relies on these unspoken questions. And I know just a, recently I had something where the, you know, very simple request, which is that the company was looking for snowmen and you think, okay, snowmen, that's great. There's about 50 ways I could do a snowman right in this moment. And so you say, well, is there a certain color palette or a trend you're trying to tie into? And, and then they come back with, no, really, whatever you would like to do. And you think, okay, that's not actually the right answer either. So I went and I made three trend boards of where these snowmen could get. And mm -hmm. then all the information starts spilling out. So after they see it, now everyone has an opinion on where mm -hmm. the snowmen should be. So you kind of learn to like anticipate the fact that there's always more information that people are forgetting to tell you. And so I think that's one of the huge, huge pieces. Um, the other part that I would sort of say that is really important to understand is what our role is in this business. Um, I think so many of us really, like we love what we do. We think our art is, you know, companies are not here to make us look great. And it's kind of an unpopular opinion, but I always like, when we say licensing partners, that's even like an over generous way of saying it because the art is very, very small when it comes down to the whole product thing. And that's not to say the art in general is like, obviously the art is what sells it. It's what makes the company or the, the customer pick it off the shelf and buy it. But here's where we don't talk about it is that my watercolor bike having flowers in its basket is never going to drastically outsell someone else's watercolor bike with flowers in the basket. That's the part that we miss is that it's not the Nicole Tamron bike basket thing that made that fly off the shelf. It's the fact that the bike basket in watercolor was the right fit for that product that tied. And one of the things we always have to remember is that there's thousands of other artists that make really, really great pieces. And so the art as a category is a very big part of that process. But my particulars of that are not as big as like we think they are. So I think being a little bit humble with what our role is and working on all those other areas, like being really easy to work with, um, being timely, meeting deadline, communicating well, you know, hitting it before deadline even, like, you know, doing all the parts that you can help have your art be the easiest to work with can be a lot kind of longer than having the best art, right? Like that's never really on the table. And I think for anybody that's ever made their own products, you realize how much goes into that from sourcing to ordering to mm. manufacturing it, then you're pitching it to people, you're selling it, you're shipping it. And all I did was make the art, right? So it's a very small piece of that pie. And I think that when artists first get into the industry, they don't really see it in that way. So much of it is about the actual sale of the product to have you make money as well as the manufacturer. And all of those pieces we're really not involved in, right? So I think that's just a big, just a, a different mindset that's good to go in with. Um, I love that. That you're somehow lending all of your skills and talents to this manufacturer as if they can't do it without you, because they can. And so I think it's just being, you know, think about all the other ways that you can be a really good team player that don't have to do with your art. And I think that that's a really good place to, to kind of be in mindset wise for working in, in this industry. I like that. Yeah. And you know what? I just was interviewing a couple of weeks ago, Sally Swindell from um, They Draw and Cook. And she was saying, you know, we were talking about having a style and she said something that I hadn't really heard before, which was that she feels like 
her style or you know your style is how you interact with clients and how you get back to people and your communication yeah. skills and all that stuff so she's like that's why I'm you know her take was that that is why she's successful because yeah. that is part of her style so it's the package it's not it's just the package. artwork and I will say this also leads me a little I, one of my sayings and it was like a famous in my mind blog post that I never wrote when I was doing that was who gets paid for the polka dot and the reality is mm. the person that gets paid for the polka dot is the person that has a relationship to begin with because they know you can execute something. And so much of my success and traction that I've gained in this industry, it did not start there, but it's where I have stayed, has been because I can do the polka dot and I can do it timely, I can do it professionally, and they get a polished piece of art every single time. And that you're truly is more a part of, I love that Sally said that because I would agree 100% it, it, that's what makes me easy to work with. That's what I can deliver. And that's why I get opportunities that some people don't get. And because I will never say I have the best art. I really don't even know if there is something as the best art, but I've never had the best art during school. I never had the best art out of school. I don't think I have the best art now. I think I have a very professional way of working with clients that they know I deliver. And that is what I consistently deliver time and time again. And I think that that I love that she calls that part of the style because I don't know that I would have done that, but I feel way more confident saying that now that I heard. If Sally says it- If Sally just, says it and Nicole says it, then well, everyone should be saying it because yeah. no, it, it is true. That is, that's, you know, that's part of what you deliver. And when I talk about sending out pitches to people, to art directors, you know, I, sometimes students say like, well, you know, I have no prior experience. So what am I really- presenting well first of course you're presenting your artwork that you're putting into the pitch but you know having having relationships with in your previous jobs your job you could just be a good communicator at your job you could be the person who is the problem solver at your last job even if that job is you know like working at a restaurant or something you know it, it could be anything but the the type of skills that you bring to you know figuring out how to you know, get to the root of a problem, whether it's a design problem or a manufacturing, I mean, obviously not manufacturing, like we're figuring out the mill stuff, but sometimes honestly, clients come to me and they're like, so we sent this to the mill and it should work, but it's not working. And then I have to kind of sometimes, you know, using my experience, I'm trying to like troubleshoot of like, well, I'm not sure why they're lining it up like this, but maybe we could try this. And, you know, so there, there is even a certain amount of, of that after a while. And once you've been working with a client for a while, so, but you know, too, I think one of the things when you're saying, like, if you no, don't have that experience, what am I showing? And I think one thing, and I came, to, obviously I came to this later, right? Like I didn't come out, I had to learn again and it was new for me. And I came with like a decade that I wasn't even making artwork, right? So I think especially... I know a lot of people are coming to this, not fresh out of school, not coming from a design job. And yeah, I'm, I can totally speak to that because I didn't have any of this information. And I think we really do discount that those working years spent in other areas as if they didn't matter or didn't count. Because, you know, even right down to like when I worked retail, I always will say that is what got me through Surtex because it was that mundane program thing of, hi, how are you? What are you looking for today? Like, I would, I'm so shy. I would not have been able to do that, especially around my own artwork. Have I hadn't had the, that like million years of saying that mm. thing and again. So I really think that when people come to this industry, especially from other, other places and other paths, we, they come in thinking, I know nothing. And you realize you really do know so much. And like I said, so little of it is the art. So you have all of this other life experience that really is gonna play into your surface design career that never was before, like, you know, it existed before the paintbrush even happened, right? Yeah. So that's kind of a thing that I think is, is helpful to know because, you know, you don't want to, you, you think of it as starting over and it, it really isn't. It's just redirecting your efforts. I think you're right. I'm writing down notes because I have these interviews and then I'm like, there's things that I want to like remember and then I totally forget. So I'm not like just like planning my meals for later. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, what? Let's see. Um, so one reason that I'm totally in awe of your career is because uh, from what I can tell, I think you make most of your, your money from art licensing specifically. Mm -hmm. And that is some unicorn magic because 
as I talk about all the time, I really don't make that much money from licensing. Um, most of my art income comes from freelancing. And then in the last year, starting a big course. Now I, I also make money from, from selling courses, but, um, but when, but the bulk of my art income has always been freelancing and building up that licensing has, has been something that I've sort of like, okay, maybe I just plateaued. Like, is it never going to get, I don't know. So do you, well, first question is, do you do any sort of like commissions or freelance work at all? Or is it really genuinely it's all licensing? It's all licensing, but I, it let, made me laugh when you said it's like, you know, print ads. It really isn't magic at all. It's the fact that I no, it is no, Nicole. It's, incorrect. <laughs> it's not, I will tell you why. It's, it's not. It's the fact that, so I have always thought of like unicorn magic as anybody that was able to make their full-time income through their artistic career pur pursuits versus like analytical ones. Because I had always, I have the right left brain thing going on. Me and I yeah. made my money from that other side. And so, you know, to me, that's been the goal, right? How do you support yourself with your creative talent? So this is where the magic just completely disappears. I was coming from a non-art industry. So it took me a decade to find it. But when I put roots in the ground, it was with one specific goal in mind. Every single ounce of time and energy and research and piece of art I was making was all directed at one industry. So it's kind of that idea of all the eggs in the one basket, which, you know, really funny. I, I don't know that that's necessarily the best idea in the same way that I don't think it's really great to go to Surtech having not talked to anyone in the industry before you drop money on it. Like, right. It's just, it's what I did. So because of that, and one piece of advice I was given really early on is that the amount of art licensing income that you will make is directly related to the amount of art you produce in a year. And that includes if you have a sick kid or if you have to take care of a family member, whatever makes your art production goes down, your income will also go down. Now for me, I 100% had no income coming from art. So it's a very clear line to say every dollar has come from art licensing because I didn't have any art income coming outside of that. So 100% of my time, energy and focus goes into art licensing. 100% of my time, energy mounts from an income from that. Now, the really cool thing that's happened for me over the past 10 years is I've met so many amazing people that licensing is a portion of their income. But guess what? They're coming from other places. They're coming from children's books or um, like editorial, or they're already doing stuff with fashion. They're doing quilting. They're sewing. They're, they're doing all of these things, teaching. Uh, it's maybe your direct consumer sales. Like there's all different things that for me at this stage, I find very difficult to add in because what happens is for time to go to those, I will take it away from art licensing. And then therefore my income will go down with art licensing and would need to shift to, to some of these other creative pursuits. So I think what you'll really find is it's less magic and more math that where your time is going is going to be split between a variety of creative pursuits where you make a variety of creative income sources. Or what I've done, which is the all the eggs in one basket approach, which is 100% in, 100% out. So it did take a number of years to have that transition. And I worked full time doing a non-art job while that happened. But one of the greatest, like I think one of the things I was most proud of myself for was when I was able to match and then out earn my non-art income. To me, that's where I crossed the threshold of I'm making income from my Yeah, I mean, 100%. Pretty validating. To so me. yes, that's, I mean, that's like something that I, yeah, that I'm ask artists all the time is like, how long did it take you? So, so how, as long as we're there, if you know, like, so you were, when, when you were at Surtech, you were still working a full-time job. 100%. In addition to that, I was working a part-time job so that I could pay for Surtech. Because I'm a huge, Lord. like, no debt person. So I, yeah. I've been a licensed optician for 21, almost 22 years. Love you know, it. I, I knew that, but I forgot that. So yeah, I love it's that. Like a, it's like a weird fun fact for like a whole lot of parties. But yeah, if you're trying to figure out your progressives, I'll be your girl. But yeah, it's definitely, um, so I would take all of the income from that part-time job, which I did, you know, five hours a week. And I would take every dollar and that went into my fair tax fund. And so when, was, okay, so part-time job, full-time job, when were you creating? art oh I actually I slept for about three to four hours a night for a good two year break maybe two two three years and it's it's something I can't picture myself doing now right I, I couldn't even think about it but I think 
because again, I like I went to school for art. When you're motivated and you're excited about it, and I knew it was you just right do it. Thing. That's the thing. I think it, I knew the sacrifice was worth what I did. And it was a means to an end. And honestly, it was it sustainable? No, it really, really wasn't. But I just I really had a very clear vision of where I was headed with this. And I did get to that point where, you know, obviously I was like overextended, like to do it was horrible. But and I remember my husband had said something and it was an interesting concept because I don't know why I didn't think about it, but he said there's no way you can work this hard at one thing and have it not happen. And so it was just that idea that it was time to sort of let the full-time income go and survive on what I was doing. And I to say that though, I set myself up really well. I was um I I basically saved enough to have a year of expenses. So basically I wouldn't need to have a single dollar come in from art licensing. And it, it had started to come by the way. It's just I didn't need to have it really start coming. If nothing happened for a year, I was actually okay. And that really did a lot for my ability, not only to leave the job, but not go back to the job. And I think that that was what really set me up to kind of go. But yeah, I did it all for longer than I hoped I would have to. But um, yeah, it, it definitely, it took me about, I want to say from, from $0 to where I was like, paying for my my booth like I didn't need the part-time job although I still worked it but like you know I paid for that with my with my art licensing income and I would just keep reinvesting that back back and I think it really took about three possibly four years to make the income piece completely replace and um, another thing Terry used to always say is that art licensing is the best way to become an overnight success in three to five years I've ever heard that one <laughs> so yeah, and it's, it's awesome. really very very true is that you work so hard and you know I remember like my fourth or fifth year at Surtex I had companies that were like oh my gosh this is amazing where have you been and I'm like here I've been here every, every year, year. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know it really is that and then the other interesting thing is um you know switching platforms from being on my own to working with my agents it also took about that three year period not to like make back where I was it's not like that but it took three years to really start getting in a groove with their clients and that's a whole nother platform so that three year mark I think is so important for people to understand that it's not an instant game and um even when I signed up for my first Surtex show, in my mind, I was not signing up for one show. I was signing up for three, and I ended up being there for five. So, you know, it's really something that takes a considerable amount of time. And, you know, that's time past the research kind of production time. So that's why I'm such a big fan of, like, start, because it's still going to be three to five years from when you start. Yeah, not learning. I know. I well, learned so another director. When I started with licensing, it was 2013, and I started by looking for agents, basically. Um, and so I talked with, you know, I was lucky enough to have sent out pitches to maybe uh, six or seven, maybe. I can't quite remember. Uh, it might have been more, but um, uh, two or three. I think maybe two got back to me and were interested. And so I was talking with them. And then I was also talking with some of their artists. And I, we certainly recommend if you're going to sign on with an agent, talk to their artists. <laughs> Very important. Hot tip, guys. Um, so I was talking with some of their artists. And so Jewel is my, Jewel Branding and Licensing is my current agent. And so I was talking to their artists at the time. And basically at that time, they were pretty much only like three years old, four years old, basically of an yeah. agency. So when I talked to the artists, they were all at that tipping point. They were like, it's been a long ride. Like it's slow. It's hard, but three, like now it's three years now it's coming. So just know that it's going to take that time. Yeah. Um, which, so I was also prepared for that basically. Yeah. However, prepared and like, willing is a little bit you know like I, like I still at like a year and a half I was like but I just created all these collections and because like I didn't really have a licensing portfolio so no. I would like went very hard my first two or three years creating all these new collections and I'm like I created all this where is the payoff and then you know the payoff still wasn't where I wanted so then I was like starting to kind of like double up on what my agent was doing like I was trying to reach out to people too and and so it just I don't know it still never really like blossomed the way I wanted it to and so mm -hmm. I mean then I started to have more traction with freelance and so I did put you know it's interesting that you're saying like it wasn't magic it's just that I was only focusing on licensing and, and I guess you know yeah, yeah. my my 
attention drifted and because I had already done all this and I'm like, you know, you keep hearing, you make your licensing portfolio and that's, you can reuse it forever. And like, I knew that that wasn't totally true. Of course you have to come up with new stuff, but I'm like, I still have 20 collections that haven't been licensed. They're sitting there. You know, this was me. I still uh, have lots of collections. Now I have like 70 collections that haven't been licensed because I have 90 collections and maybe 20 of them have been used all the, and some various bits and pieces, but that's the thing. It's like, I have so much art that hasn't been used. So I'm like, why am I going to make more? Like I get like new trends and what people are asking for. I do understand that, yeah, but it's also it's I'm a, like. Mass production is like not even like, a, I mean, it is, it's so much work. And it's interesting that you said like at that three year mark, because I actually, I don't know that I realized the two were kind of connected, but like every three years, I tend to have a complete meltdown of this isn't working. I'm wasting my time. And like, I basically implode, but here's the thing. I think this is what kept me kind of getting back up. I don't have experience in other places, right? Like I don't have the freelance client to lean back in. I don't have teaching as my background. Like, I, what I have is like, do I want to go back to being an optician? Like, heck no, like that's not <laughs> happening. So like, yeah, I like pick myself up every three years because I do, I do think that there's, there's some growth that happens every three years, but just before the growth, we have this complete second guessing of ourselves. That's like, is it going to happen at all? Is it going to turn at all? And that's a really difficult place to get through. And I think it's an important thing to talk about because there was no point there. I was just like, oh, I did Surtex and then I'm an art licensing artist. And, I, and like kind of that's the abbreviated story, but it took so, and it's, it's continued to do that. Yes, so. I know. And that's me too. You know, like, it's like, I get so impatient. You look back and you're like, okay, sure. But isn't what's, I feel like there's this famous quote, or maybe it's like a graphic I saw something basically where you're tunneling and tunneling and tunneling. And you're like one step away from coming out the other side and you don't know it yet. So you're like, I just did all that, forget it. And you quit. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, you know, that's like and that, that graphic. I, th I feel like that was like an Instagram graphic or something, but I was like, yeah, no, that's a very famous story. I think of a family that was like digging for gold in California or oil or something. And they end up selling the whole company and the company that buys it finds it like a foot first oh like it's, it's oh actually very like, <laughs> there we, well there we go yeah so but that's the whole that's thing totally that's, and that's what it is so you just totally. yeah, but it, uh, you know I don't know it's well, like we all go through it it's the thing we all go through those moments of you know and because I, I you cannot discount how much work it is and I, I really do I say that and I'm a worker bee I, I love being busy and I'm a, I'm a I'm just a generally wired to to almost like be that overachiever type a I just love making stuff and working all the time but it's a, it's an exceptional amount of art I mean I actually am so completely like I mean sometimes when I do teach we have like sophomores and juniors and then sometimes seniors and the seniors are looking to put together a portfolio of what is it 12 to 16 pieces and you think Oh, okay. <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm it's a sure place to start to pitching yourself. Like, yeah. Yeah. You're just like, oh my gosh, I do that in like a couple weeks. Like, I mean, my portfolio is just, it's, it's amazing the amount that you produce, but it's also amazing the amount that is consumed by the industry. And I think that that's one of those things that's really interesting is that we always say like, is there room for everybody? And it's just like, they just need so much art. And it's because yeah. it doesn't stay on the shelves. Like you and I, I think both missed that heyday of licensing. I don't even know what that was about, but. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of it. <laughs> you know, it's heard it, like the, <laughs> the rumor, but like you don't make a collection to make $20,000. That just doesn't happen now. And so I think because of that, like mm -hmm. I place an exceptional amount of art. It, it's, but it doesn't earn a ton. If you look at any one of these contracts, and I think this has been, a big learning lesson for me is I always have to look at my collective for the year because if I look at any singular industry or any singular contract, you're never going to get that contract and say, yep, that was worth it. It's not. None of them are. And so I think it's just one of those lessons that you have to learn. And it's because it's like that. And I am that kind of all or nothing person. I have to do this in a holistic kind of way where I look at it and I say all of the art, all of the kind of creative generation I'm doing over the year is netting this amount of money and that makes sense. So that's where I think a lot of people get discouraged in licensing is that, like I said, you're gonna put a lot of time and effort in and you know sometimes people do hit it and it's great, but um, the majority of the times that's not gonna be the case and you have to look at it again as this 
group mentality of what did that collection earn or what is all so of how many earned? how many like do you have kind of stats or an idea ballpark like how many pieces of art or collections or you know do you do each year do you think or each month let's say how about each month is that easier to yeah, break it down like so it's weird so I would actually you would ask me a little bit about how my my work looks basically like yeah yeah talk to me about it so um it's interesting because it's changed from the time I started to where I'm at now um when I started of course I was like I don't even see some trends it was like I just felt like making this thing and here's a group about it (laughs) so like I don't know I just I started with just things I was attracted to and made and of course like I talk about pieces that were never licensed like I have this whole like Victorian hat pin collection with like hats and hat stands because I was like convinced steampunk that was going to be like my solution to steampunk like never went on anything but you know it's it's like I just made stuff and that's kind of the starting point now what I do is it's kind of a mix um I would say they're collections I come up with on my own but they're actually not I I have like themes and ideas and sometimes I'll have like icons I'll sketch out or paint but I tend to not push play on any of those until I start to see client needs start to come in whether it's trend boards or you know something or I'll have something that's like kind of I don't know it's just like fuzzy over here and then I'll see something that I'll be like okay now that's a good direction for this grouping and then I will use that as a catalyst to start it so I usually do that twice a year I'll release collections in July and January and those correspond of course with um, gift mart in Atlanta so uh, those two times a year I'm putting out groups that were not technically required requested from somebody but they definitely were they started you were, th- you were thinking about them because yeah, they of started somewhere um, so so is that like two or three collections you release at a time or like how much <laughs> so this january i just released uh i think i released 10 collections so i did good lord five christmas and five every day i don't tend to do as much in july but then you never really know so i also probably will do a grouping for Christmas and I'll do a grouping of every day. And then the rest of the time is split into specific client requests. And that's actually a really interesting stage. And I think it's one I hit probably in the last two to three years, again, like kind of that that three years with my agent mark where, um, and they had actually said that too, is like, I almost in a weird way feel constantly behind schedule now, but it's just because all things I'm working on have a deadline on them. So it's not like I'm, thinking of something that I'm like, oh, that fits for this need. It's, it's no, it's like, this is the need. They're re- requesting it and asking for it. And, so and they want your specific style in your hand. So they're yeah. calling you to say. So, getting, so it's more request based. So it's really just like having freelance clients only instead yeah. of getting paid by the hour or the project, I'm getting paid with a guaranteed license. Um, but when I do those projects, because sometimes they could be singular, because we know that single pieces of art might just be fine for certain clients at that time, because again, I'm very all or nothing. I usually will paint all of the elements and plan out an entire collection because at the end of the day, again, take your two steps back. I know that collections place better in multiple categories if they have all the parts and pieces. So, and I learned this a little bit from doing greeting cards. Greeting cards is a huge one that you only need a single. But like I have a stack of artwork that my agent hasn't even seen that's an entire greeting card line that I've launched that I have not figured out which parts and pieces I will package together to make a full collection. So sometimes things happen like that too. But I also, like I said, one thing for a client, one image for a client, I will take the time at that stage to paint for the whole grouping. And then I will basically turn that into a full collection, even though that client's only picking out one piece of that. So I I basically, it's, it's a lot more, I do not need to, it takes way more time to do it that way on the front end. So that's why I think sometimes my deadlines feel tighter than they actually are. But on the back end, and this is where I always shine, I keep saying like when I say, fulfilling needs and being able to fill holes that's how I'm able to do that is I already have these parts and pieces ready to go I just haven't maybe mobilized them yet and Mm -hmm. that's that's the secret sauce in terms of like filling client needs especially when you're a traditional artist because there's a fair amount of art that's that time then there's the computer time then there's the design time so if I can circumvent a couple of those steps I'm in a much better position to do what seem like miracles overnight are actually mm. not. They just have to do with the way I've structured my day and, you know, how I've kind of, but I always, 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 I try very, very hard not to have singles floating out there because singles for me, beyond that one project, they go in the trash. And what I already know is that a single image isn't going to be worth my time for the amount of money. So I always try to think about that in those terms. 
Hmm, that's so interesting. Uh, one thing that I think that I do did well when I worked in house was systemizing, right? And, and finding the things that I need to do regularly, getting ahead of that when I have more time, getting ahead of the things I need to do regularly. And that's, and, and having moved into freelance, it feels, it has felt like, you know, I'm always kind of treading water basically, or not treading water exactly, but there it's, it's very hard to systematize because, yes. um, you know, especially like a fr freelance. So, you know, you're working in a way that is sort of like freelance, but because it is your art that you control, then you have the opportunity to build beyond that and, mm -hmm. and do that thing. Whereas if a freelance, you know, client of mine is coming to me and saying, we need a gift bag that has this lettering on it and it has elves on it or whatever, then I'm doing that. And they're, uh, that's their direction. I would, if I can't really just like take those same themes and make it into like three other things because or that's like, their stuff. Exactly. So exactly. if they need that one, they're paying me for that one and it is what it is, you know, so. Yeah. But like that mentality of that sort of like you presented with something, a theme, a look, a color palette that you then have to turn around there, I, cause I, it's funny that you say that treading water, cause that's kind of where I feel too, cause I am much better when I have these like systems in place, but no, I really don't because I'm doing that same treading water process too. And it's like, I think part of why I feel a little bit behind the ball a lot is like, I'm not anticipating client needs. This is a client need. So you're responding in real time to that need. And I think that there right. is a bit of that feeling attached to those, those projects. I think that's just what I, what I think is just the nature of them. Truthfully. Yeah. So, I mean, even just from what you're saying and, and, you know, I'm sure it is hard to figure out exact numbers, but it sounds like you make, I mean, you have been saying, but like so, so much more art than, you know, I mean, probably not necessarily more art than I do with freelance, but obviously with licensing is like much more than I do for my licensing portfolio. So, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. um because you're constant because all you're doing all day every day but but even even you're actually you are doing more than I'm doing freelancing because I before we started this interview you were like okay I was up late last night I have all these collections I have to do and I'm working on every weekend and so you are working non-stop which yeah. makes me concerned about your health but you know that's you know that's, I know but I also you know again I have I have different reasons for doing that and I think partly you know, one of the things I always sort of bring up is like, well, what's your why? Why are you doing like, so the why is not so much kind of support myself with art right now. My why at the moment is I have a child that's going to be entering college in a year, right? So there's a huge push there that if I have the opportunity, and I will say a little bit of this, like I took a big chunk of time off during this year with quarantine, because I am a purpose-driven artist and I didn't have a way, I didn't have purpose and was looking for art. So I actually did not make art over the summer. Um, but because of that, in a weird way, I feel like I'm like where I was at the beginning of my career, which is that I almost have to fill my pipeline again because we've had this interruption to the process. Mm. So in my mind, right now at this stage of my career, I'm going to take on everything I can. And, you know, I may be at a point later where I'm able to put some of those things down. But right now, if the work is here and it's not lost on me, I mean, I'm so thankful to be doing this. Like, it's not lost on me that this will go away tomorrow. And I hope that's not where it goes to. And obviously on the larger sense of building my business, because, you know, one of the things we always talk about is scalability. I have um, reached my max probably with how much art I can probably produce. And so because of that, of course, in the licensing sector, what would my solution to that be is having collections hit multiple markets better than they are right now. So either taking collection and recoloring it or styling it a slightly different way so it has more of a home decor look than gifts and stationery. That's one way to do that. The other is to hopefully be working with clients. And this happens naturally that your SKU count with them gets broader as you have success within the smaller program. So, you know, again, having working better with clients so that you have larger programs. That's another way I hope to grow my business in a larger sense. But at the moment, and it's, I always look at it as, again, means to an end. I did a certain level of work when I was just trying to get things started and I'm doing a certain level of work now. Is it like that all the time? Not necessarily, but this time of year it is. And yeah. so I think that that's just sort of part of it. And again, remember, we're coming off of a year where there was a complete shutdown stop of all of these things, yeah. right? So you kind of look at it as you recharge where you can recharge and then every opportunity I'm given, I'm going to take it and I'm going to run with it and I'm going to see where that's going to lead me in the, the long run. Yeah. So that's a, it's the long-term play. It 
it really, really is. It's not the like short term game is, yeah, I'm tired, but it's, you know, was I able to get those three groups out for the same week? Yes. And that's actually a huge thing because that's going to mean three different sources of income that will come in like the distant future. <laughs> Two years, it's fine. Two years, it'll be totally <laughs> worth it. You don't no, need that. That's, uh, that's awesome, though. Um, so yeah, you just uh, sort of explained about how you work with manufacturers and how they're coming to you at this point because they knew they're used to your or they know your style, they know your how it is to work with you. Or they, um, they know that I'll deliver. <laughs> that's what it is like. So you, um, so you have an agent, which you know despite, you know, uh, that was a surprise to me because I know I have been to Surtex and seen your booth. I remember seeing you back when you were exhibiting and, you know, you have, you did have such a strong start on your own without an agent. Um, so what was the reason that you decided after five years, you know, to take on uh, an agent and what advice would you give to artists who are just starting with an agent? Yeah, I think for me, it was a really really hard decision to go with an agent and um, honestly if you had met me at any one of those surtex shows I would have told you I was learning the business so I could be an agent myself because I just okay. I love that side I really do and I think I meet so many people that are immensely talented that don't have the kind of like more structured side that I do so I kind of always so I was always talking to agents I was learning how they kept their files like you know just learning 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 which I think is so great and I even remember telling my agent now I would explain this whole thing to her and she like without even understanding that they were like interested in me and I remember she said this thing and it has always stuck with me um she said it all great artists reach a point in their careers where their time is best spent making art and that was such an unusual statement for me as somebody who is new to even making art at all for income like where are all my kind of the things I feel more confident about do not rely in me making art realm. So for her to say, like, your time will best be spent making art, like, almost didn't compute at all. And it, like, caught me so off guard because I didn't even realize, like, that was the conversation we were having. It just sort of took that turn because I had, again, I had, like, the agent blinders on. Like, I had, I was really, I mean, you're surprised. I'm just as surprised that I have an agent right now, to be quite honest with you. Who but is I, your agent? Right, can you share that? Or well, Yeah, um, it's Courtney Davis. And it's really funny because yeah, yeah. when I signed with them and the first year I wasn't at Surtex, people were like, where's your booth? And I said, oh, I actually signed with an agency. Nobody knows who Courtney Davis is, which is very comical to me because in my world, Courtney Davis was always a name I knew because they're very traditional. They've been in the market for 30 yeah. plus years. Um, yeah, I do know that. Really I, do. Are the, I remember seeing them at Surtex. Yeah. Oh yeah, they were there for years. And that was actually one of the really funny things is um, they approached me about that. I just, again, it wasn't on my radar. And so I just like, wasn't ready for that. And like, are you really ready to sign with an agent after Surtex, right? Like Surtex is like a fun event, right? You have all these new opportunities. And yeah, all exactly. Fun. You're like <laughs> hoping that it all works out. You're not going to sign, yeah. Right. But yeah, I just, I think for that full year, and at that point I was full time um, doing art for I think a, a good two or three years, I was on my own. And I think you just start to realize um, that like the same thing, my capacity for wearing all the hats was starting to wear thin. And I think at various points over the year, I just sort of thought, would this have been better if I had someone to talk to? Or I kind of knew I was going to be kind of getting to the point where I either need to hire somebody in like a consulting session or something like I would need to be hiring out some of this work and um I was not the artwork but parts of my business and then like after a full year had gone by I thought well I should probably reach out and just find out about it because again I had like I mean I was like you know I'm, I'm an all enough in person so if I wasn't interested in having an agent I didn't even like know about that right right so I thought I should at least have a conversation and I remember looking on the Surtex website to see if I could set up an appointment during Surtex and they weren't on it and mm. I was like that's weird. They've been here for 30 years. <laughs> so it was just like this weird little thing. And then out of the blue, I got a call from them that was just like, just thought we'd check in, see, go, see where you're at. And I was like, wow, that's like crazy. It was like your ears were burning. Kind good, of. good timing. So yeah. I was about it. And um, yeah, I had, a, I had a really good talk with them. And I remember crying the whole weekend before I signed because I quote unquote in my mind had not made it on my own. Oh <laughs> my like, gosh, that's that was so like not true. Uh -huh. but I remember um, Stephanie Ryan had said, like, are you seriously crying about signing with Courtney Davis? Because <laughs> she's like way more experienced than me. And she's like, that's just the silliest thing ever. And sometimes I think you need those friends to like reality check you. Yeah. And then 
um, Ronnie Walter actually had framed it and she was so good for me because she said, you took your career as far as you could bring it, but it was not going to grow. So you needed to hand it off. And I think that's been the biggest thing is understanding when it was time to let go because I really, if I'm, I know I did not, and I'm still, they're probably, <laughs> I still haven't really let go entirely, but um, that's been a really hard thing for me, but like I had to let go in order for me to grow further. And that's the ultimate goal is I have really, really like, like I have big dreams for this, right? Like this was not like, I wanted to like replace my, my income. This was like, I am now earning my husband. I am now going to grow even further from that. Like there's just these, these markers that I hope I'm at like the very beginnings of and I'm structuring it. So it's that way, but in order to do that, it can't be a one woman show. And as much pride no, and yeah. the confidence as I got from running my business in those ways, I had, if, if this is going to be it, I had to kind of let them do what they do. And they are insanely good at what they do. They are so respected in the industry. And I have, like I said, I have four, four agents. They all handle different accounts. The personal, they are able to fly out and meet with people. They are, and they always say their goal is the first phone call. And I really do feel like that's true. They are the first phone call for their agents because they have a 30 year plus history of delivering on that first phone call. And so, I mean, you know, the company of some amazing people, um, I always say like, I want to be Susan Wingett when I grow up. And I like mm. totally think that like, I just, to me, she's just such like, just, she's just incredible the way that she's built her business. And, you know, she's like one of the top two in the entire industry. Like I would love to grow to be a Susan Wingett, but if not, I'll just be in her company and kind of get to hang out in front of the same clients. And, you know, I think it's, there's just some incredible artists there that really just, you know, I feel like kind of an imposter being there, but they're been super sweet. And like, they just have welcomed me into the family and there's so much knowledge in that little group there and like so much love between them. And I think that's one of the real successes to that agency is it's very small. Um, I don't know how many artists there are actually there, but there's really only like 10 of us, 10 to 12, they're active. And there's four agents. So like you do the math, like I mm. talk to people every week. And so as of all the art agents out there, I, I don't know that there's a better one for me. I think I'm just, I struggle with the agent artist yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. But yeah, they're, they're just amusing. But I think for people who are newer to the industry, I think there's two types of people. There's people that are um, really just know agents are the way for them. And I think for those people, if you really, really know that if your kids are small, if you know you're doing this in addition to some other part of your career, I would say, I wouldn't talk you out of that. Uh, for anyone that's on the fence, I would say totally go it alone. I think I refer to my third tech years as like my grad school. I mean, I probably paid as much, and but I learned even more, right? Like I yeah, just, yeah. that was my learning curve there. And I think that one of the reasons I've been successful with my agency is the fact that I did have all of that knowledge going in. So they didn't have to teach me. It was just sort yeah. of like, I was handing off a part of my business. And I think the other key point there is um, that idea of being patient is so, so key for if you're on your own or if you're signing with an agent, because agents are not the magic golden key. I think no. that people really think that like they sign with like their dream agency or it's not, it's, it's really, really not. You have to look at it. You as still have to do the work. Partner. Yeah. If you're just business partners, there's still that aspect of luck and just, you know, timing. Um, but yeah, patience is really the biggest, biggest key that I think um, it's the number one thing I, I think when I talk to a new artist that kind of did come into the agent role, they just seem like, like you had said that too. And I felt like you said too, right? Like I put all this work in, I put all of this work in and you haven't placed this and you're wanting more. And the, there's like a frustration there that I can totally, I totally get it. Right. I have the same ones. I, I kind of go back to my agents. I'll be like, did this Christmas group ever place? Because it's really good. And I don't know why it looks just like all of my other traditional groups. And I'm curious as to why. And sometimes it's a matter of, they just had too many that had that dark background in a year. Right. So right. sometimes it's like understanding it has nothing. And again, going back to the idea, it has nothing course, to do with the art. It doesn't have anything to do all, with you. At all. And it's kind of so funny because we are our art. <laughs> it's like this weird identity crisis. Like, it's not you, it's me. It's like, but yeah, the patience piece is so, so key. And, you know, I think, um, like I said, the, the people that I've met that have gone into the agent, like first out of the gate into an agent situation, yeah, they're just frustrated with the whole experience. And I think, well, you know, I, like, I've been there. I understand like things get cut, things don't get chosen. And I had all of that on my own too. The one thing I will tell you I have less of is the, like the $30 checks, the couple hundred dollar checks when you realize 
two years later, you invested your time poorly with a company. And I think that is one of the things that was a big shift to working with my agency was they've been doing this for so long. Every decision is based on historical performance. And if I had that data, that's how I'd run my business too. So I think because that was in line, I really felt that that was a great approach to how they worked. And in addition to the fact that, you know, when you're researching, yeah. everyone's researching which places you think your stuff is great at. Every single client I would look at, and I had, and I, I have a list too. You had asked me something about your dream client list. And I actually have this list that I made while I was researching and on my own. And interestingly enough, I'm actually working for every person on that list, except for maybe two or three, but they've been knocked off because they are not historical performers. So congratulations. Really, yeah, they've changed over the years. And I think that that was the other thing is that they were already working with all of these people. So when I would go through those catalogs and see Courtney Davis artist after Courtney Davis artist, and I knew I was meant to be there. What I didn't realize is that those companies with these historical relationships, some of those slots are already gone. They're not, you're not getting one, like tabletop, if you're looking for one of 12 groupings for a season, you're like, okay, I got a one in 12 shot, you don't. And I think that was something I really didn't understand. Like I had been sending my art to these people consistently for five years and had not made traction. And what you don't realize is that some of the agencies that had these standing relationships, three might be at Wild Apple, like three might be at Courtney Davis, three might be, so you might be fighting for one of possibly one slot. And that's the difference. And that's not to say you can't make an income because there's lots of tiers of licensing. It just happened to be that my target client list was that top tier grouping of companies. And I don't know that I would have gotten into these companies if I hadn't already had that relationship with Courtney Davis. Cause like I said, half of them had already seen my art. <laughs> it was just like, yeah. oh, this is so much easier. You're working with them. I, this yeah. makes it easier. And it was so interesting because that last year at Surtex, that was the response is, you know, I knew I needed to sign before that show. Cause I needed to know, I wanted to be upfront with who's doing my follow-up and you know, the look of relief and just ease when I said who I was signing with, because they already worked with them, they'd be like, oh gosh, this is perfect. perfect. Yeah. Love them. And you're just like, okay, well, that's great. Cause that's, that's truly what they deliver and they deliver it day in and day out is they're like Southern charm and comfort. And I just love them. And they're just such sweet people. So it's, it's really about finding your, your right agency. That's like a huge, huge one. Make it, very, the decision needs to be very thought out. Think about it. Like when you're dating, you're locking arms and half the time you are splitting your funds. So like treat it just like that. You need to be really researched. I love your suggestion because I say this too. It's like reach out to other artists, find out what their experiences have been. And then I said like patience, patience, patience. Yeah. Awesome. Well, yeah, I think the patience thing is, well, first of all, so hard and I have no patience. Um, it's hard for everyone, I'm sure. But I think that's where that is where the difference is of, of why you're a magic unicorn, because you had the patience to stick with the same thing for so long as it built. Whereas I did it and then I started to do, I'm like, okay, but where else, can, how can I do, make this work? I need to make this work. Like I'm working so hard to make this work. So I can keep pushing this licensing, but also getting a little, you know, nibbles over here and here and, and doing all, cause I had started to try to freelance before licensing. Um, and in my mind, like signing with an agent was just like another way to like get more work and like whatever. So, but yeah, like people, you know, so many artists, it's like, you know, they're trying to make licensing work, but they can't just keep submit, you know, they also have to start their society sick shop and do other things because, because the patient's, you know, and the no guarantees just make it like so hard to just stick with one thing. The idea that it's almost like this like mystical unicorn almost is fitting because I think there's a fair amount of just like blind faith that goes into this. And I think oh, yeah. that, those have been my, my major meltdowns is having something happen. Cause you know, I'm very analytical too, right? Like I, I would totally, I go where money is. That's like, and I, I do that with licensing as well. But if I, and that's why I would say like, I think Part of the reason I've done this is I didn't have other things that were showing me a more immediate return because the way that I am, the way that I analyze things, I really do believe I would have gone down one of those other paths otherwise because there's just, it just makes, it's what, licensing doesn't make sense, right? Like the whole time we've been instructed, don't do work for hire, don't do money. I'm like, I'm sitting here and it's so funny because I'm, I'm now in these like, 
clubhouse room for you of artists in like a global sense and you like you kind of were like oh i can't open my mouth <laughs> like people it's it's not all of it is sex work and that is so against everything and i know artists are out there and they're like this is we need to fight back against all and i i totally get that and that's why we all get to choose these different aspects of our business the things that work for us and i think because i am a long-term player and I've, I've learned to be more patient um the the reward with some of the licensing stuff is going to out earn anything i'm going to do through other channels but it's the idea that you're waiting for the larger payday with your every day that's why i was saying like that whole thing you have to look at it over the whole year because if i'm ever going to analyze it by collection or by project licensing is not worth it. like it's just not it's just totally really not and like I said, those three year kind of meltdowns I have is because you kind of think, am I having blind faith on something that doesn't have a basis in reality? And I think that's where, um, you know, I've, I've learned some actually through your interviews and from talking with other agents, I started to get these um, income projections of what was normal in the industry and it, it could have knocked me out of my chair because that was not my experience. And I'm so glad I didn't know that though, in a weird way, right? Because if At I- your, your, You were making more money or less money? More money, yeah. 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 Because it's not livable. It's not livable to have it just be my, but again, mine's my one, my one and only. Right, right, right. So I think, but I'm really glad because if I had had one of those moments of like, I'm having blind faith for it and this person's telling me the average income is X. I would have quit to be very honest with you because, and I'm just, I'm very glad I, again, like a lot of why I've had success down this one road is I didn't have all the information. And I think that that's actually some of like, it, that's why the blind faith actually worked. And, yeah. you know, now I can look back and say, yes, years go up and down, but um, overall, I mean, this is, it's amazing, right? Like you ask the person the right question one day and I've changed my entire trajectory of what I do. That's an amazing thing. And I yeah. think that's one of the cool things about creative industries is you really don't know where you'll end up or what will be successful for you. And I think it's one of those really, like, like my favorite thing is seeing people who use licensing as part of a larger structure because I don't know, I don't have my head in the sand. I want to like always look and see because again, it could go away tomorrow. We don't know. The heyday is no longer. Who knows? Mm. Maybe what we're dealing with now is going to be kind of go by the wayside at some point as well. And I don't want to get stuck. You know in that capacity but you know for for the time being i'm having a very traditional experience with licensing and i don't think that's the traditional path any longer i don't think it has been for quite some right time. right um, right that's, that's, that's what when i was in in one of my questions it was like uh yeah you know that you earn all your money i was like i don't think hardly any other artists under 50 years old you know what i mean because that's the thing it's like the older artists ha do have those relationships yeah. and and they've come up through a time when when licensing was you know more longer term you know, like they also, products were longer term have that more traditional artwork style so exactly those yeah. are these actually is who i'm up against and my my jokes that i always like and i say it with total love because they'll they'll go until they can't because i'm like i'm just gonna wait till you retire and, I'm and like, then i'm taking it. all right. your things yeah 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 totally <laughs> but yeah they, they the older artists are just i mean i don't even think of them as older artists because i have just no uh, no i mean I the, the veterans like veteran artists that have really weathered this industry um i've just had some amazing they're like, so talented artists. and know the market so well they know the everything. market they know what's up and down they they like i said they've, they've been in the heyday and they're still there so there's obviously a reason for that and they're also just like so supportive of new people and i think that that's been one of the greatest gifts i've had kind of working through this industry is like i didn't have the classes i didn't have the real education i had like this duct taped version of one that i kind of put together for myself but i've had an amazing amazing mentors on my my path here so that's been a total gift that you know you don't find a mentor mentors they do it for you yeah. for a reason, reason but um i've been very thankful for that side of things because you know we all we all are just learning yeah exactly how many years <laughs> Right. Well, in thank you so much for for sharing your knowledge because I know that there are so many people who are looking for that guidance and want to know more about you know licensing. And I can only give so much information because you know I do licensing work, but a lot of it, you know, like I said, I'm not certainly not my full time thing. So um, I appreciate your perspective so much, and um, thank you for joining us today. Oh. Thank you for having me because you know I would love to teach more and I just but I don't have the capacity for that because this is fun and I get to share because I love I love talking shop and I love sharing and 
it just I think the industry is just it's such a wonderful place to be and I love to meet people like you and just we all get to kind of kind of hook up in, inside that in some way so that's definitely I would, well I, I will that. leave your you know definitely your Instagram and and your information in the description for this video so everyone go check out Nicole as you can tell she is a wealth of information so um thanks everyone thank you guys if you're interested in more information about running your own surface pattern design business, go to my website and check out my blog where I talk about all things surface pattern design and have way more interviews. Also subscribe to this channel and follow me on Instagram.